Good morning and thank you for joining us today at Sun Yat-san Nanyang Memorial Hall. I'm Ernest and I'll be your moderator for today. Before we begin today's uh, lecture from Han Fu to Chong Sam, foreign influences in traditional Chinese dresses, let me first give you a brief overview of the talk. So with the rise of the Han Fu movement in recent years, one might be misled to think that Han Fu and Chong Sam are very different in their DNA as the traditional Chinese dress. Han Fu was touted as the authentic dress with over 2,000 years of unbroken lineage for the Han Chinese population. Whereas for the Chong Sam, it was demonized as the Manchurian dress imposed upon the Chinese population by the other or foreign ethnic groups. However, if one looks back in history closely, one will realize that the historical evolution of what is commonly known as Han Fu today has much in common with that of the Chong Sam. This lecture looks at the history of dressing in Chinese culture and explore, explores its diverse uh, foreign influences throughout history. Our speaker today is none other than Miss Gong Pan Pan, uh, also known as Han Fu Go. Pan Pan was first introduced to the term Han Fu in the late 2015, when she chanced upon a beautifully made garment that looked nothing like the ubiquitous uh, Cheng Sam. Yet it was referred to as the traditional dress of the Han Chinese. She first created hashtag Han Fu Go in 2016 when she started dressing up in traditional Han Chinese dresses to work. She combines her visual photo artworks with editorials that often challenge pre-existing assumptions or stereotypes about the Chinese culture. And it also draws parallels between the past, the present, uh, the East and the West. And so she formally established the Han Fu Go's Collective with like-minded individuals in 2019 and she also accepted the residency at the Stanford Arts Center under the National Arts Council in 2020. In 2021, the collective conducted lectures, workshops, and immersive performances related to ancient Chinese women and their arts. The collective seeks to challenge the stereotypes and misunderstandings about women's identity in ancient Chinese narratives, and also to emphasize the confidence and independence displayed by Chinese women throughout history contrary to the usual assumptions of them being submissive or weak. She believes that we only need to look to the past to see the future, and that women should feel empowered to their own identities by challenging these stereotypes. So without further ado, a very warm welcome to Pan Pan. Pan Pan, please. Thanks for having me today. Uh, today I'm going to give you a very brief uh, history of the traditional Chinese dress and its evolution over the past two to 3,000 years. First off, we're going to start with yeah, our collective. So on the screen, it's actually a, um, a very brief visual history of evolution of Chinese dress from the Han Dynasty on the top left corner to the Chongsam. So the idea of fashion, as we know, in the turn of the last century, was actually a brainchild of uh, you know, capitalism. So fashion was supposed to be changing rapidly so that you have the fast turn of fashion and people consume things. So through Western eye, the Chinese dress seemed to be like immune to change. It's a costume. And people were like thinking that, you know, the Westerner philosophers or sociologists were saying that, you know, Chinese dress doesn't really change. It's as stagnating as the society itself. But Chinese being a more relational society actually focuses a lot on hierarchy. So dressing to them was not simply something about um, you know, uh, fashion styles. It's, um, it's really very important to the identity because through for thousands of years, it was um, showing of your hierarchy. You have to wear certain style according to the season, according to your social hierarchy, and it was all codified in law. So that was something that's very different from the Western concept of dressing up. So we have a few quotes at the turn of the last century. The Chinese family of last century looked very much like a Chinese family of the classical age. Really, we'll look at it later. And then the variation in Chinese dress from dynasty to dynasty occur at the speed of rather Heston Glacier. Yet again, it's the emphasis that you know, Chinese dress, dress doesn't seem to change. And then the Mandarin's robe scarcely changed in the course of centuries. But then Chinese society itself scarcely moved at all. So it became a politicized comment about Chinese society, about how Chinese society was so hierarchical and so um, oppressive that it, it justifies certain um, actions by the West as to have this superiority over the Chinese. And it's not just the Western scholars. Uh, famous Chinese literati, Eileen Cheng, also was saying that you know, generation after generation of women wore the same sort of 
clothes without feeling the least perturbed. So perhaps, I guess, the most perturbing thing about the, her comment is this internalized Euro, Eurocentrism that she displayed without knowing the real um, evolution and the details of what Chinese regarded as the dress and how it really changed quite a lot as part of um, the evolution. So this is a very uh, quick video for you to have a general idea before we go into the details. So that was a very brief history of Chinese dress evolution. Um, to start off, I'll, I'd like to just talk about what is Hanfu and what's the relationship with Chongsam. So Hanfu is this term that's been very popular recent years uh, because of the rise of uh, you know, the traditional Chinese dress of the Han Chinese. And uh, people like to say that you know, Hanfu is the authentic Chinese dress of the Han uh, ethnic group, which is the majority of Chinese. Uh, and that Chongsam came after it was more of a Manchurian invention. But the idea of Chinese identity was actually not so clear cut, as we can see later on throughout the whole ex um, presentation. And if you look at the um, picture itself, it was actually a combination of a chongsam in the inner part, and then the outside is a modernized uh, Ming outer coat, uh, which looks a bit like Japanese haori. So, you know, uh, there's a lot of cross influence between different cultures in East Asia as well as from the West throughout the whole, um, whole history of China. Uh, from 2,000 years ago until today. And we we'll just talk about the dressing identity of the Chinese. So Chinese culture is very hierarchical traditionally and it's driven by aristocrats and scholars. So there's the hierarchy of the scholars, the farmers, 
the um, craftspeople, and finally the merchants. So it's very hierarchical, and the, the idea of Chinese in a very ancient past was just a very small area in central China, and then everyone around it, including uh, you know um, south of Hunan, which includes the southern coastal region, would be considered the barbarians. And it's rich with symbolism because they believe a lot in the representation of colors and different. Um, different period of different rulers, they will actually um, look at different colors as their um, dominant color, as their lucky color. And hierarchies is also dictates what you wear in terms of what color you can wear, uh, what material you can wear, even what kind of weave um, in terms of the fabric you can wear. And so um, a lot of uh, it's a bit like Chinese painting. You look at it, you think that you know it's very uh, abstract, it's very stylized, it's like, and you think that the Chinese are not capable of. Um, creating lifelike kind of um, images. But the fact is, to the Chinese mind, which is very uh, literary driven, um, being lifelike to them is vulgar. They feel that that's what the craftsman would be doing um, to be so technically competent. For them, it's the aspiration, the essence of things that they capture. So that goes with the dresses. There's a lot of rich symbolism that embeds within the um, dresses. And when you change certain things, it's not such a big drastic change as in the change of the whole silhouette, but more of the small little tiny changes that, uh, as, that makes uh, what uh, is important for a Chinese dress. And the innovation in the fabric was also very important because you look at it and then you look at um, the Chinese uh, weave, they've changed a lot over the years and it was also in a codified term what people can wear, what kind of weave they can wear according to our social hierarchy. And that is kind of change that was very invisible to the Western minds, um, to the Western scholars when they were looking at the Chinese fashion. They were looking for a change in silhouette, silhouette but the actual change was in a lot of the subtle details. And the Chinese dress was generally flat cutting, flat inverted comma, because um, it's not like the Western dress with 3D tailored to your body, but it, it does have certain kind of flow to it, and it was very nature driven. So they like to see how the fabric flows on your body and creating a certain kind of silhouette. And as I mentioned, craftsmanship is a lower priority because um, they were very big on uh, literati and this aspirational idea of uh, uh, you know, literati-driven culture. And then defining fashion in Chinese term, as I mentioned, it's codified. It's a full set of look from what you can wear on your hair, what you can wear on your body, what kind of motive to what shoes you can wear even. That was all in the books and the variation would be within the boundaries of those rules and it's a highly politicized and moralized event, what you wear. So, and it's related to your national identity and national pride because dressing to the Chinese is so important. So they wouldn't be creating a lot of fanciful style that's out of the norm, but within the boundaries, they actually created a lot of variations. So just talking about moralizing fashion, um, there were actually four main schools of thoughts in the very ancient dynasty about 2,500 years ago. And um, generally on the left is Confucius, He's the only one who's different from the rest. He believes that you should dress according to what is your social status and what's appropriate. Whereas the, all the other three believe that, you know, fashion is something that should be just functional. You shouldn't waste too much resources um, changing and innovating and, you know, trying to be appealing to different vanities. So vanity was a big hoo-ha, a big no-no to the Chinese because they value farmers, you know. They believe that you have to be sustainable. You have to appeal to, uh, you have to value the hard work and labor of people instead of just keep changing for the sake of um, like what we see today as fast fashion. And so there were five milestones in terms of foreign cultural infusion in Chinese fashion that were quite drastic, um, bringing about a lot of changes in terms of material, in terms of um, the, the colors or changing styles. And this was the Warring State, which was a period of 300 years of war where Chinese was made up of small kingdoms. And then there was the, uh, after the Han Dynasty, which is also again a period of great change when the nomadic tribes came to China and there were a lot of kingdoms breaking up and then, you know, uh, having warfare and intermixing of culture. And Tang Dynasty as well is a very big um, period where there was a lot of trade going on between the West and the East. And Qing Dynasty, of course, there's a, again a lot of changes because of the Manchurian rule and also the exposure to the West. And finally, the Republic of China because of the modernization and again, the foreign influences. So this is just a very brief um, look in terms of uh, how the, the timeline looked like. So what is Chinese and what is foreign? That is a very interesting topic because we're talking about Chinese dress, right? And what is foreign? So 
um, throughout different periods of Chinese history, the land that they occupy varies quite a bit, and so did the definition of what it means to be a Chinese. Um, you know, the idea of Chinese was, uh, it's a very diverse kind of concept. And if you look at the original, really ancient idea, the center part, the Huaxia, that's actually what was traditionally known as the Chinese population. So even though today we all identify ourselves as being Chinese, in the ancient past, we'll be relegated to the idea of a southern barbarian. And then there was also the northern, western, and the east um, so-called barbarians to the Chinese. And they were very big on differentiating themselves with the rest to show their civility. And so during the ancient period of Shang, that's the area that you occupy. It's actually a very small area compared to today. And during those period, about 2,500 years ago, which is the Warring State period, there was this new idea that came about. Uh, it was about the, anything in the, whole, um, in the whole cosmos were divided into five elements. So it, it translates to five different main colors that people should be wearing if you are of a certain status. And the five elements also translates to um, materials as well as, you know, eventually to the seasons. There are actually five seasons to the Chinese, ancient Chinese, not four. And also there's also like uh, your medicine, the Chinese traditional medicine was also divided into five different elements as, and it corresponds to your body. So everything was divided into five. And the emperors and as well as officials, when they go to um, you know, court for a special occasion, if you see in a TV drama, they wear this hat, right? Um, and dramas, they always just have one kind of color for the beads. But technically, it should be made up of five different colors to correspond to the five seasons. And different ranking officials will wear different number of beads. So that's how codified everything was. So it's highly uh, ritualized because you know, during the Zhou Dynasty, which is about 2,400 years ago, um, there was this Rites of Zhou, uh, which is this book that basically tells you exactly what you should wear for which occasion, down to the detail of like, different kind of embroidery, what kind of colors, and what kind of things you should match. So they're very, very particular. And if you get it wrong, you're actually like, you know, disrespecting the rule. And so, but then within the different regions, um, there's also a lot of variations because, you know, not everybody, you know, abided by such rule. And, a lot of the rules were very generic when it comes to commonness. And a lot of the rules were um, based on limited resources. So in the past, it's very difficult for you to dye a piece of cloth. So when you have a very intense color, you have to dye over and over again to get a color. And that's why it's very limited to the upper society. And the commoners will usually be wearing very simple color, which is like white color or plain color dresses. So it's from that basis that they had all these rules. And for the general public, they had this top and bottom dressing style or one-piece rope with decorative borders, but it was just very plain kind of dress. Whereas the upper class, they would be wearing silk red ones. The lower class would actually be wearing the coarse hemp cloth. Um, cotton was not common in China during that time. Um, they had traces of cotton in certain archaeological date, but by and large, it's really hemp. And the Chinese would have this tie string mechanism because during that time, they didn't have um, the influence of the West to have uh, hooks and belts. So traditionally, Chinese were always tie string, and they were secure it on the right hand side. So it's a Y shaped kind of um, dress where the right side is the final, the top piece. And so you see that this is like um, the Warring State um, figurines. You can see that it probably reminds you a lot of the kimonos. So yes, that's um, the one-piece rope that ancient Chinese about 2,000 years ago were wearing. Um, and they have this big belt in the middle. And they had this fashion of having a tiny waist. So we always think about that, you know, waist and the corsets as having tiny waist. But about 2,000 years ago, there was this fashion of tiny waist too. And it was actually written in a story um, by this philosopher Han Fei. He basically said the king of Chu, which is like southern kingdom, he really liked people with tiny waists. So all his officials started starving themselves to be very have tiny waists to the point that when they were having a, a court session with him, they were fainting because they were so hungry. And he was actually using that story to tell people like, do not curry favor. You, a ruler should not like people who curry favor him. He should like people who tell the truth because if these people can't even, um, you know, eat properly, they can't even give you sound advice. 
but that kind of shows the, the culture of that period of this preference towards a very tiny waist. And you can see paintings that you know, uh, women were dressed in a one-piece robe and with a special emphasis on a tiny waist. And gold is actually not very uh, traditional Chinese, even though today we associate Chinese with gold. But in, back in the ancient times, um, the literatists especially, they favoured uh, jade. So gold was something actually more of like a Western kind of influence, most likely from the Persians or Egyptians um, that brought in the uh, habit of gold. And, and then pants. Um, ancient Chinese men didn't wear pants. They wore one-piece robes. And it was because of the military adoption of pants that uh, people started wearing pants um, in the Chinese society. So I mentioned that people are very big on identity in terms of being civil Chinese, Han Chinese, compared to the nomadic tribes which they saw were barbarians. So initially when um, the Lord Wuling of the Zhao Kingdom, he proposed to adopt pants for military use so that it's more convenient when you go to war, um, they, he faced a lot of objections. So, um, but then eventually he managed to persuade the king and then you know, they finally managed to adopt it. So people would, generally the court officials were very um, not, uh, not for it because they feel like it's a dilution of the Chinese uh, civility by wearing pants, by wearing something that the barbarians wore. And when they finally adopted it, it was definitely a lot more efficient for war. People can ride horses properly, people can run properly, you don't need to get obstructed by a lot of fabric. And then they started winning wars. And the surrounding countries, uh, the kingdoms, they saw that, oh, hey, um, this kind of dressing, even though it's barbaric, so to speak, you, you, you get things done. So being pragmatic Chinese, right, they started adopting it throughout. So that started a wave of adopting pants in Chinese culture. Yeah. And also, of course, with the pants, that's not just it. It's also the leather shoes, um, the way of using metal hooks for fastening and securing instead of the tie string. So imagine going to a battle and your string come loose and everything come loose. So it's not very pragmatic. So definitely, this were a lot of the Western nomadic tribes' influences because that's just the lifestyle and it's definitely a lot more efficient in war. And as we mentioned, the securing on the right versus securing on the left. So the nomadic tribes will secure mainly on the left because I think horse riding, you, let, you wouldn't want the wind to go in um, to your body. So definitely, you need to secure on the left. Whereas the Chinese being agrarian, they just, just, uh, differentiate themselves by securing on the right. And the pants, these were like really pantyhose. That's the kind of pants that ancient Chinese men would have worn under their robes. And that's also why Chinese people, they had to kneel. Because can you imagine you sit and they didn't have chairs in those days? Um, it would actually be exposing a lot of things. So um, it's definitely like, uh, it's a very Chinese thing to kneel because of the the restrictions in their garments. And yeah, so this was, this was uh, the kind of pants that the ancient Han Chinese would have worn in a traditional way. Um, and the kind of um, pants, like two pantyhose, plus uh, like a loincloth kind of uh, um, shorts, that was uh, all the way until Qin Dynasty, which is like the last dynasty of China. That was the kind of pants that they still continue to wear. So it comes back in fashion once in a while. And then you have the Terran Basin, which is like the Western nomadic tribes. So Terran Basin is actually Xinjiang, which is the modern day China. And that's actually considered a foreign land already. And then we have the Qin Dynasty. So this is the, uh, and after that, there was the Han Dynasty that ruled for 400 years, the longest period in Chinese history. So people were wearing um, the Qiji, which is the one piece rope, we're in two pieces, and the dancers were wearing like something with a water sleeve, as very, um, very familiar with. And the craftsmanship of uh, Chinese silk was uh, at a, a very highly sophisticated period. For one of the archaeological dates, there were actually two ropes, which is about 10 pieces of A4 size paper weight, and it's really huge. And um, they were not able to replicate it until today um, because the silkworms were actually producing very fine silk during that period. And one of the joke during the uh, one of the interesting story that I read uh, of a Tang dynasty was that this Arabic trader was looking at a Tang official, and he saw a mole through his um, silk gown, and he said, "Wow, you're wearing two layers of silk. I can still see your mole." And the official laughed, and he said, "I was wearing actually ten layers." So it goes to show how fine silk were in the ancient Chinese society. 
And then there was a period of like 400 years of battle that broke up in China. And Chinese was divided into many lands with a lot of nomadic tribes occupying Chinese land, intermarrying and introducing a lot of um, their culture within China. So even rulers um, in the later period, they were actually of mixed blood uh, of nomadic tribes and Chinese. So, so during that period, during this war period, um, prolonged war period, there's a lot of influence. So cotton was brought in from uh, uh, India and like um, Buddhism, but it was not the cotton as we know today. It was kapok, which is like from the tree instead of from the shrub. And then they started wearing furs, um, and the Han Chinese were using it mainly as a decorative thing. And then the Bei Wei, which is uh, a nomadic tribe, which is also one that merged um, with the Chinese and started ruling Tang Dynasty later on. Um, there was this ruler who was so um, pro Han Chinese wearing that his own people killed him because they were afraid of betrayal. So this idea of uh, identity and dressing was very in ingrained into the society. And there were a lot of um, attempts of different rulers adopting Chinese dress to uh, show their civility. And then there was this adoption of pants by the society instead of military. So people started wearing pants more and more. And you know, it looks like you know, the 80s style, uh, you know, of the Beatles style. So that was the archaeological dig from, the, um, from that period. And women, of course, they have very fantastical kind of hair. Um, some of them were like, inspired by paintings, and some of them were actually like, um, because they have access to more material goods, and then they were able to like, do really fancy hair. And then comes Tang. So Tang period was actually a very cosmopolitan kind of culture because the rulers themselves, they were of mixed descent. They were a mix of the nomadic tribe and Han Chinese. And during that period, the Silk Road, um, both maritime as well as the land, were very much active. And you can see that the culture, the dressing of the Tang were actually very different from the earlier period because of these Western influences. And they were very big on uh, stripes. So, you know, um, on the right is Emily Floch, which is a Bohemian designer who inspired many of Klimt's painting, and she was seen as a fashionista at the turn of last century. And this kind of fashion was actually uh, already, you know, worn by Chinese during the Sui Dynasty, which is about, uh, you know, a thousand years before, more than a thousand years before. And they really liked a lot of stripes. Even kids were wearing stripes. And they have this very high waist or um, on the chest kind of thing, which is a very uh, not Han Chinese dress. And you see that they have very narrow sleeves, which is easier for movement. So all these are foreign influences. And we always think of Tang Dynasty as like the low plunging neckline. But actually, the real plunging neckline is not the typical one you see in the show, but rather like that kind of a vest, which is a V-neck kind of thing. And that occurred in early Tang period, when it was still a very um, Western nomadic tribe kind of style. Yeah, so it was, if you look at the Tang style, you realize that it's actually quite modern. And o over the years, you saw that you know, as time progresses, the Tang women started to wear uh, a lot more flowy dresses. Their body also get rounder. Um, that is more of a, like a influence of the Han. So Han people are used to very flowy dresses. And the nomadic tribes, because of the lifestyle, they like really tight ones or, or narrow, or easier for movement ones. And over time, they sort of adopted more of the Han aesthetic, and the dresses became longer and longer. But it also signified a lot of wastage of material, such that a certain period of time, the Tang Emperor mandated they shouldn't wear uh, dresses more than a certain kind of, uh, using more than like X meter of cloth. So um, over the history of Chinese culture, it's always been a case where at the beginning of a period, they always be very frugal and um, uh, frugal about it spending. So when they dress up, it's also very simple. But as they become richer and richer, they start to become decadent and they use a lot of wastage. And uh, there's a lot of brilliant styles emerging, but also a lot of wastage at the same time. And women during that period, because of dress got so long, their, their shoes also have very fanciful patterns. Um, the flap in the front of the shoes was actually pointing up so that you can tuck your skirt on top of it. And when you walk, you won't trip over it. 
And you can see that even during a period based on whatever archaeological dig we can find, there's already a lot of these kind of styles. And they were also made out of very brilliantly weaved materials. During Tang Dynasty, the, besides weaving um, the patterns, they also had all this uh, wax resist dyeing, which is a bit like batik, um, and also uh, other ways of like, making patterns. So that was a period where there's a lot of um, brilliant colors uh, from everywhere. And there's also, of course, cross-dressing. Cross-dressing is not new to Chinese culture also. Um, and during Tang Dynasty, it was especially popular because it's convenient. So uh, male, uh, female attendants, uh, or even princess, like Princess Taiping, who is the daughter of uh, Wu Zetian, so she liked to wear um, the male robe as well. And we see a lot of archaeological findings of um, females wearing uh, the male robe. And that male robe was actually more of a um, Persian kind of style. So on the left is actually a reenactment group in Europe who um, look at reenacting the Sogdians, which is the Central Asian traders, the way they would dress. You can see that it's um, secure on the left, which is a very nomadic way. And the Chinese Han, uh, the, the, the Tang people were actually secure on the right. But by and large, the styles are actually very similar. And yes, yeah, so attendants would like to wear it, uh, and they wear it on top of pants. And of course, they love the opulent and the foreign. So they've got all kinds of facial paintings, decorations on their hair and their, on, on their face. And this will actually influence us also from uh, foreign as well as indigenous to Chinese. And the accessories, um, there were a lot of gold during that period. Gold is not like when you watch TV, right? You know, it's not a transactional item. It's not like you can give someone ingot to buy something else. In those days, a gold has to be gifted by the emperor, and you can't use it to buy things. You have to, uh, you can use it to, you know, make accessories. And so um, they were using a lot of um, like turquoise, which is less China than uh, than the traditional Chinese. They didn't use a lot. There was not a lot of jade. There was a lot of gold and. Um, this kind of precious stones that was more like foreign influence. And you can see the similarity between the Chinese accessories and that of, the, say, the Greek, as well as the Meso Mesopotamian. And of course, Buddhism, a lot of the necklaces, the exaggerating, uh, brilliant big accessories that Chinese women were wearing towards the end of Tang Dynasty was very, very much an uh, influence of India because of, of the um, popularity of Buddhism in China. And also the motif of lotus, uh, as well as the mandala in Chinese motifs um, and the dresses were also an influence of, from India. And also the mili, which is the Chinese veil hat. It was definitely a Chi uh, not an indigenous Chinese one. And it used to cover the entire body. And as time passes, it became more like a, um, it became shorter and shorter. And it's mainly worn by aristocratic women when they go out horse riding. And brows, um, the brilliant brows of Tang Dynasty, they were very uh, bold and thick compared to the traditional Chinese of thin brows. And um, the courtesans were definitely the one that driving the fashion. They were known as the brow ambassadors. And uh, you can see that even based on whatever we can find, there, were, there were actually a book that will mention about 10 different brow types. And we can find that more than that during history. And there was this, towards the end of it, uh, Bai Ju, a famous poet, wrote about the contemporary makeup of the period that was influenced by the West. And he saw it as a sign that the country is going uh, into decline when women stopped powdering their face with normal powder and they started drawing this downward turning brow and coloring their lips dark. And of course, there's also this rouge that they were applying on the face that resembles that of the Tibetans. So Tibet and China had a very close relationship during that period. And in the early days, um, Princess Wen Chen uh, was married to Tibet to civilize them. So the irony is that uh, when the Chinese married her to the Tibetans to civilize them, uh, they, uh, she, was, she went there to tell them to stop applying this kind of makeup on their face because they saw it as not um, civil enough. And then towards the end of Tang Dynasty, there was this comeback of this kind of style where Chinese women started applying this on their face uh, because it's fashionable and they thought it's a nice thing to have. And this is a few of the photos uh, of the Tang styles. Yeah, 
So generally, Tang period was actually very, you can see, it's one of the major periods where foreign influences was very big on Chinese fashion. And then we came Song, which is a lot more um, inward looking uh, than Tang. Um, in terms of um, the styles, it's not more muted, it's not more um, stylized. So that is the uh, style of Song period. And you can see from ceramics, it's definitely a lot more understated, a lot more simplified, and more zen in that way. And they started wearing, well, it's led by the courtesans because of ease of movement. Um, then they had this base, which is a straight cutting kind of outer vest that they wore, um, brilliantly decorated. And men and women both wore this kind of dress. And if you think that Song just meant minimalist fashion, uh, that's not really true because you do see women started wearing really uh, elaborated dresses, head dresses especially, uh, and on their face. So you've got this crown with like, horns on it, um, and they, like, yeah, then this is the recent drama. They try to reenact the um, Song period fashion by the empresses. So they use a lot of uh, kingfisher feather, and they love um, flowers on the head. So like the two attendants on the side, they were wearing what is called a all in a year flower head. So they basically you know, create all kinds of artificial flowers and from all kinds of seasons, from the four seasons, and place it on the hair. And they decorated their face with like pearls. So it's, uh, it's by and large, um, even though the aesthetic of the period was more muted uh, and they do not apply as much makeup as we, um, you know, say the Tang period, um, they still had a lot of fashion change going on. Yeah. You can see, and there's this interesting makeup um, that highlights the, th uh, the forehead, the nose, and the, and the chin. So it's a bit like our highlighter today. So makeup during that period was also quite advanced. And they prefer a very thin brow, which is again back to the ancient Chinese kind of aesthetic. And because Neo Confucianism started in Song, a lot of people think that the Song women dress very conservatively. But um, actually, if you look at certain paintings from the period, women were actually out there working as well. They're not homebound. And the way they dress were actually quite, uh, quite sexy, I would say. And they also had this, the beginning of mami and skirt, which is again another courtesan-led fashion. Um, it was actually a piece of, and you can see the, the fabric, it's actually a gauzy kind of weave with pattern. So that's what I meant by, you know, they have a lot of subtle, um, differences in the way they make certain dresses, um, not just in the silhouette, but in more like the material itself. And women also wore pants under their skirts. And men during that period started wearing flowers on their head, on their, um, on their hats. Um, it was actually more because towards the end of Song Dynasty as well, um, the emperor ran out of money to give to the, his officials. So he started giving them fresh flowers, and it was seen as a, like a prestige to be able to wear all this on the head. And you think that, you know, uh, you know everybody thinks that Chinese is associated with food binding, uh, but actually that's a Western influence in Chinese culture. If you look at the turn shoes replica of a 6th century European style, you will see that you know, Chinese um, sort of get the influence from, or inspiration from that kind of um, narrow feet. Because during that period, um, they didn't bind their feet to 3 inch. Um, the archaeological dig found that it was about 13 cm long, so it wasn't that small in that period. And it was, it was, it was said that they were inspired by the West to have a smaller feet and narrower. And then came the Yuan Dynasty, which is the Mongolian rule. Um, that became very popular in terms of the use of cotton. So it's still kapok, actually, um, that they were using. And, but then it's integrated a lot of weaving of gold threads in the, uh, in the dressing. So before that, Chinese didn't use that much gold. Um, and you can see that on the left, it's a Mongolian um, men's rope. And on the right, it's a Chinese men's rope on top, and a women's wear at bottom. Um, both of them were weaved with um, gold threads. And you can see the similarity between the Mongolian rope and the Ming period rope. And that was a period because of all the commerce, uh, you know, uh, they had almost hundreds of styles. And women were changing their dresses from originally like 30 years 
um, one style to every two to three years there was a new style coming up. And you can see that there's a video. Yeah, so um, after the Mongolian rule, the ruler of, uh, of Ming decided to return to the Tang and Han ways of dressing. So he sort of reinstated based on the, uh, on the, uh, on the records what Chinese would have worn in the ancient period before. And that includes the, how the emperor should be wearing for different periods. And uh, you have thought that you, know, you go back to the town style, but where evidently they took in a lot of the uh, Mongolian influences. And they started having really high um, collars. So what we see as Mandarin collars actually was a very Ming kind of thing. And they started to have uh, buttons that's made of uh, metals, and, and they started back, yeah. And then you know, they were using a lot of foreign fabric, which was the Indian continent. It was the Western Sea fabric, and they also have Western fabric. And soon China started to learn how to replicate those fabric, but they weren't able to reproduce the Western fabric as yet. And then there was the Indian cotton during the Ming Dynasty, um, the muslin, that was actually very popular during the Ming period as well, which um, it was lost. So when the Western, uh, the, the British were exposed to it, they actually made a satire a joke about you know, how translucent it was and how immoral it was. But if you think about back to the Han Dynasty one, that was the, the silk, how the Chinese wore, you realize that you know, China has been there and you know, they passed that kind of fashion phase already. So Chinese were very innovative. They keep changing their fashion style. And during Ming, um, there was also expansion of colors. There were 120 shades of colors for dyeing at the end of the period. And seven shades were completely new from, like, they never had it in the past before. And Nanjing women were evolving you know, their new dress every two to three years. And it was just a fantastic display of dresses. And if you look at the similarities between, let's say, the hanbok and the Ming um, dress, it was um, the hanbok, the top of the hanbok grew shorter and shorter, whereas the Ming dress got longer and longer. And you know, the hat, the xinyong that they have on top, um, they also had like full set of accessories on how you should be wearing that kind of um, dress on top. I mean, the, the head dress. And the face, horse face skirt was, you know, we mentioned it during the Song Dynasty. It came in really popular during the Ming period. Um, so it was a Song courtesan fashion that was made popular during the Ming by the aristocratic women as well. And during the Ming, late Ming, over 20 different fashion styles, and they prefer thinner fabric. And the Western fabric also were preferred. So there's, you definitely see there's a lot of cultural exchange between the West, the Mongolians, as well as Chinese in terms of how they wear. And then they also have this interesting, like, uh, you know, pieced together kind of um, dress. And then we come to Qing, which is the last period, which is ruled by the Manchurians. So the imperial dress code, I think, um, we don't have to go through, is like they have four formal codes, which is like the, ma the formal, the smart casual, and what we always see on TV is actually the casual kind of dress. Yeah. And Manchurian women and Han Chinese dress differently. This was a painting from the uh, emperor's uh, collection, um, Yongzhen Emperor's collection, and they were all like his concubines. Um, they were Manchurian women dressed in Han Chinese wear. So Han Chinese women continued their style, but they were influenced by the Manchurian wear. And you see that the Han Chinese women were wearing two pieces, the top, a long top, and a mamian skirt generally. And then, the, and then they have a small little collar, which is not very high. And then there's also a lot of decorations that went on towards the end of that period, uh, which, is, which eventually went on to Changsam, as you see, which is the border that is decorative. Um, they had like all, all kinds of border decoration, all kinds of ways of making those border, and a lot of times they would embroider a different kind of motif on it. And there was like three gun, gun and xiang with different kinds of uh, borders that they, were, they had and all the way up to 18 layers of that kind of decoration. Um, fat and narrow border and all these kind of names, they had all this intricacy. So they definitely had a lot of innovation during that period. It's just that, you know, because they're so through details that most people, if you're not aware of it, you wouldn't see them as a big change. And even their shoes were brilliant decorated. So you can see 
those were the tops. Um, and if you look at the details of how the embroidery went and the decorative borders, you can see that there's a lot of variation already. And the sleeves, they also kind of, they have like horseshoe sleeve and they've got um, hooved sleeve and like uh, a folded sleeve and all kinds of sleeves as well. And the Manchurian rope, and we always look at Chinese as a Mandarin collar, but that was a Ming kind of fashion. And during that period, um, uh, you know, then Chong Sam, uh, it was the, the Manchurians didn't have collars. They had to wear a scarf around themselves when they don't have collars. So when you come to Chong Sam, you realize that that was adoption of the Ming kind of collar. And, you know, the dresses, they had all these accessories that was uh, made popular during that period, um, which uh, we don't have time for, to go through today. But that was just towards the end of the Qing Dynasty. So, um, yeah, so, so then we come to the, um, you know, Chong Sam, which is what we're all familiar with, with high collar, which is a very Ming kind of fashion, instead of a Manchurian. And it's a return to one piece, as we've seen from the start. In the Han Dynasty, 2,000 years ago, women started wearing ropes. So we see the fashion is cyclical, and uh, you realize that Chong Sam, even though it was uh, seen as a Manchurian invention, it integrated a lot of Han Chinese elements, and the Han Chinese fashion also integrated a lot of foreign elements throughout its evolution. And this is where we are today. And then it evolved um, to a more Western cut. Yeah, so that's the end of today's lecture. Thank you, Pan Pan, for such a historically rich and insightful sharing on the Chinese dressing culture and start exploring the changes throughout history. So now we'll be actually commencing our Q&A session. Uh, please be reminded to use the QR code on the screen to send in your questions, as uh, we won't be able to accept any questions from the Facebook comment section. So we'll give you a little bit of time to sort of send in your questions. Uh, while we wait for that, we actually have a few questions that have come in already. Um, so one of the questions is, what is the most popular style in Singapore? So. The most popular style in um, Chinese tradition, right? Yes. I would think that it would be the Chong Sam, because that's the natural evolution. Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, um, the most uh, popular style in Singapore is definitely the Chong Sam, because of natural evolution. Uh, of uh, the, the, where the immigrants brought over their style of dressing um, to Singapore. But um, in China these days, there are people who wear uh, Chong Sam as well as Han Fu. It's just that uh, Han Fu is making a comeback. Yeah. Uh, we have another question. Um, not too sure if this pertains directly to the Chong Sam and Han Fu, but uh, there's a question on whether the foot binding started in the Song Dynasty or before that. You mentioned just now it's the yeah. Western influence. Yeah. So foot binding was said to start from the Wu Dai Shi which is the En Tang, um, which is the five kingdom, uh, um, the five dynasty and ten kingdoms period. It was said to be started by this concubine of the emperor um, who bind her feet and the emperor really liked it and it became very popular. But um, there's also theories that it was a Western influence and some really adopted it a lot more, except that during that period, it was more of binding your feet to be narrower instead of like the three inches you see in a later period. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Sally. Uh, will you please elaborate on the history of horse face skirts that you mentioned in the first appearance in the Song Dynasty? Okay, uh, so the horse face skirt was first worn by the courtesans in the Song Dynasty. It was not so popular, uh, but you know, slowly over time, um, the aristocrats' women started to adopt them, and it became like a really a formal wear during the Ming Dynasty. Oh, okay. Uh, so we have a next question. So, uh, when did Chinese women started wearing all these earrings and accessories that you brought up in? Yeah, so Chinese women didn't traditionally wear earrings because it was seen as not, uh, it was a damage to your body in a way, it's not filial piety according to Confucian tradition to do all this. Um, and then slowly there's a lot more of the influence from the minority or the nomadic tribes 
and you see that there's a lot more earring uh, worn by women towards the Song Min period. Yeah. Are there any more questions from the public? Oh, okay. So we have a question that just came in. Uh, could you please elaborate more on how the Mandarin collar evolved through the years? Okay, so traditionally, the, the Ming Dynasty women, they wore high collar with um, metal um, buttons. So that was the first time we see high, like, the, the light semblance of Mandarin collar. And during Qin Dynasty, if you look at the Manchurian wear, it was a round collar typically. They didn't have the high collar. And slowly over time, as the, uh, towards the end of Qin, you realise that the, the dress that the Manchurian wore, they started having collar. So that was like, they sort of adopted the Chinese, uh, Han Chinese kind of Ming collar, mm -hmm. and they made it a bit higher. Yeah. Oh, I see. So it was also a sort of external influence yes. that shaped it. Yeah, okay. And you see that the, Chin the Han Chinese women, their collar were actually, um, they had collar, but it's a lot narrower and smaller. Mm. Yeah. I see, I see. Oh, we have more questions coming in. So uh, uh, once again from Sally. Uh, from Sally. Uh, are there any research materials that you have come across from all this that you can point us to sort of for future references on just another question on how it is? Uh, there is actually, uh, I have this huge book. Uh, it's like my Bible for traditional Chinese dress. Um, then they did mention about uh, face horse, uh, horse face skirts in there from the different dynasties and periods. And uh, you can also, I think, find some of the publications by the Suzhou Silk Museum. I believe that they also publish, publish certain things on it. Yeah, I can share it a bit, um, maybe like um, offline. Yeah. Sure. Uh, okay, so we have a question. Did the Ting royal shoes with the heel base for women evolve due to the fact that Manchurian women does, doesn't have binded feet and this did this help them look more elegant was it that okay that's a very interesting thing because i also read up about shoes evolution of shoes uh, during a chain period as well and the, the the that shoes that platform kind of shoes was indigenous to like the manchurian women it was said that in the early period before they you know um became royalties and they were in their own tribes um it helped them to stay above the ground to prevent uh insect or snake bites and all so that sort of evolved to that kind of style. And um, Manchurian women were forbidden from binding their feet by the, by the emperor because they feel that it's, it's making them Han Chinese and not able to be like nomadic tribes as what they used to be, forgetting their traditional um, values. But a lot of Manchurian women were actually very attracted that some of them tried to bind their feet as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was, a, that, that was um, not so related in that way. Yeah. Oh, so not, it's not just about fashion, not about status, but also a certain... Uh, extend the utility also. Yes. Ah, uh -huh, I see, I see. All right, so, oh, so we have a question. So in the context of the intense cultural ex uh, culture exchange over the centuries, is there such a question, is there such a thing as cultural appropriation? Yes, that is the work word, right? Yes. Cultural appropriation. But um, if you want to be really strict about it, uh, people have been appropriating each other's cultures for thousands of years. Uh, like, for example, I mentioned about the makeup of the Tibetans on the Han Chinese women. If you look at it from today's lens, that would have been a cultural appropriation. But in those days, because they're not so aware of it, they saw it more as a fascination. I like it, I just wear it. Yeah. I see. Oh, are, are there any more questions coming in? Yeah. Oh, just one for my personal interest. Yeah. So you mentioned a lot of this is very, sort of you talking more generally about within the eras. So is there a difference sort of within the styles or choices of colors? And so variations within the regions, or would you be able to share a little bit more? Oh, uh, variations that? within region were not uh, in the ancient past. Uh, like for example, during the, the Warring State period, say the people of Chu, uh, which is the southern part, they were known to be very colorful, mm -hmm. and we see that it's not of my ethnic minorities in that period of that uh, in that period um, that part. So uh, different uh, different kingdoms they have different stylistic differences. And then eventually, when they merge together, of course, we, when we study all this history, it's based on whatever evidence we can find. And the thing is, um, the, the thing is, a lot of the ethnic groups, minorities, they might not have kept a lot of these items as properly as, say, the imperial family, who had lots of resources to conserve them, put them into barrier. And that's how, like, we have limited understanding of all these as well. Yeah. 
So, so just now you also mentioned how we actually have influences from uh, Western influences. You talked about um, Indian influences, Arabic. Mm -hmm. So it's all through trade, right? So do we see and the religion influence as well. going the oh, and religion definitely? Mm. Do we see it going the other direction? Sort of Chinese influence going out. So uh, elements of the Chong Sam and elements of the Han Fu in other uh, in other communities, uh, mm. tr traditional dressing in other communities. Do you actually come across that during your research? I think um, the influence of Chinese dress will be more on, say, Southeast Asia as well as um, East Asia, like Japan and Korea. Mm. So that is the cultural sphere that Chinese had uh, influenced on. Mm. Whereas the Chinese would influence a bit more from the West in terms of um, the other influence, like the, especially the traders from Central Asia and um, yeah, through all these trades. Mm, I see, I see. Oh, there's a question that just came in. Uh, so do you actually like to know? Uh, do you like to know? The, of the title of the book which you mentioned in your presentation, will you be able to share with you? Yeah, I'll, I'll share it offline because I don't remember <laughs> it off the top of my head. Sure, it's uh, a Chinese book, yeah. Yeah, you can reach out to us, we'll just share, share with you, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. so, okay. So, another question I have, sorry, so many questions for you. <laughs> it's such no an interesting talk. Oh, wait, never mind, a question just came in. So, uh, which, is your, which, which is your favorite era in terms of ancient Chinese uh, women fashion? And also, why did you choose this era? Definitely Tang Dynasty. <laughs> because um, in terms of fashion, you can see that it's very bold. Um, Tang women were very empowered in terms of that kind of um, expression. They were not like the, period, the other dynasties where they were like well, thin brows um, and very like uh, dainty kind of um, demure kind of uh, what look. Whereas for Tang, because of the nomadic influence, especially for the rulers, they were of mixed heritage, right? So they're very embracing towards this nomadic tribe uh, in terms of their culture identity. And they were very expressive in how they wear and they're very bold in what they do. So it, I like that kind of confidence in how they represent themselves. Just now you mentioned that there's still some certain parts because we still have a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. So is there a part that which you like just now didn't manage to cover and you would like to actually go back to it? Yeah. So perhaps could give our viewers um, <laughs> more details on, on the history of Chinese dressing. Yeah, so I wanted to talk more about um, the Qin Dynasty, that, that the idea of the Manchurian uh, dress versus the Chinese uh, Han dress. So sorry, this is slide number. Uh, so we we'll go to slide number. Um, okay, the history repeats the slide 105. Oh, slide 105. Yes, we have over 100 slides just now. <laughs> yes, let us give us a moment and we'll bring up the slide on the screen so you can all see it. So there's a lot of theories uh, of how the Chongsam came about. Um, and one of the more like, Euro, um, not, um, ethnocentric or Han-centric theory of one, by one of the literatists at the turn of last century was that he said that instead of being a Manchurian dress, he saw it as a return to the Han dress, which is a one-piece rope. And um, that was a Shen Yi, that, uh, that was the, the name for it. And, and that was one of the theories of how it came about. And then there was also a theory that you can evolve from a Manchurian rope uh, and then there's also a theory that women wanted to dress like men, so they abandoned their two-piece top and bottom wear, which is a traditional Han Chinese wear, uh, and they adopted the one-piece robe that the men were wearing during that period. Um, so during that period, uh, there was actually a lot of different styles uh, that, that people were adopting. So it was not just a one straight line of evolution. There were actually a lot of different variations of the Chongsam. And in the early stages, there were actually Chongsams that were not of Mandarin collar, there was this movement to not have collar in the Chongsam as well. Um, to uh, again, you know, to to, to re rebel against the kind of like restrictions that they saw. So um, over over time, we realized that in every era, um, it's always the same kind of pattern emerging. Uh, women they started to wear the men's dress to show that they want to be empowered. And then there's also the um, evolution of being very prudent in the dressing and simple to being um, very decadent or very extravagant um, as the society and the economic kind of um, increases. And then, you know, then that's when the peak of the empire uh, um, is, and then it starts to go into a decline. So now we're in the fast fashion. I'm wondering whether, you know, we're into that, that kind of decline as well. Thank you so much for the extra snippet of <laughs> information. Oh, we have a couple of questions that just came in. Oh, we have an audience who is actually interested in what you're wearing today. Mm -hmm. So, uh, would it be all right if we pan over? Just yeah, so, uh, so what I'm wearing today is uh, similar to a Song period dress. Um, that's like the top, which is a, is a piece of, uh, it's a one piece 
So traditional Chinese, we always have just one piece, and it's a, like a tie string kind of mechanism. So it's secured at the top, and then you have a pants. This pants would have been um, like the Chinese pants that I showed it, showed it with the um, with it's not the, exactly like the modern pants today. So the crouch part would have been opened, except that we have another layer above it to cover it for modesty purposes. Mm -hmm. And then this is the very flowy kind of style with a long sleeve. So traditional Chinese sleeve is always longer than your hand. And then you're supposed to like bring it back. It's kind of like the, the way that they want the fabric to drape over you. Yeah. I see. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> so we have another question. Um, do you have an Do you have an interest group on how info that uh, interested uh, audiences can actually join and learn more about all uh, this important part of Chinese culture? Yes, yeah, so we, uh, we have this group of women that joined a couple of years back and we're focusing on research um, so that we can conduct like, lectures for public. So, that's, um, so we were thinking of you know, maybe we'll do another recruitment for interested people who want to do research-related things. And if you're interested to just know about it, then we can do like, lectures, which because of COVID, we haven't been doing much, but we're definitely planning for a lot of this kind of content um, in time. In fact, we actually just finished a residency at the Stanford Center with the National Arts Council and that explores um, town dynasty courtesans. Because if you realize during my um, sharing, a lot of the fashion were led by courtesans. And courtesans was very different from our idea of courtesan today. We, they're not prostitutes, they're like geishas. So they're on par with aristocratic women. So the way they dress were actually the, the finest silk and all these kind of things. They were very empowered. They're the most educated women in Chinese society during that period. So these are the kind of content that we're exploring together with fashion, together with uh, female identity that we're trying to do. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Oh, we have a, <laughs> we have a compliment. Uh, thanks, <laughs> Pan Pan. I enjoyed it very much. And I like that you actually inserted photos of artifacts to compare and contrast all the different. Because sometimes it's really hard to, uh, to imagine, visualize right? yeah, yeah. when we describe things. So it's much better that it's such a good opportunity to have you here to share all these photos with us so you can get a better visualization. Yeah, unfortunately, we do not have a lot of um, co like material co uh, finding from the town dynasty and before. Mm -hmm. So they have we, a lot of them depend on like the murals or the um, or the uh, sculptures that we see. Mm -hmm. So in terms of creating, like, what, like a lot of people were saying that, oh, what you're wearing is not authentic. But what is authentic, you see, um, is based on paintings. Uh, nobody knows how it was constructed exactly because we do not have a lot of information for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's very true. And a lot of them didn't actually survive for the way. Yeah, so correct. So we only have those to reference. You can only imagine, reimagine them. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, we have a question on the detachable collars. So how, how, what about the detachable collars? So mm. did the Manchus use them? Or was yes, I was trying to find out more information about the collars of Manchurians because you, you see it shows, right, in the court where they did have a collar. So um, whatever limited resources I could find, I would see that they did have like a fake collar inside. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you wore the rope above it. Yeah. So the collar was more of a decorative purpose? Yeah, or? I think so. Mm, I see, I see. Um, okay, so we have a question on uh, how did the pockets in the Chi uh, Chinese sleeves work? <laughs> and when did this function start in the Chinese, Chinese sleeves? You know, there's not much research on it, but I sort of figure it as I was wearing all these things. Mm. Um, there were different kinds of sleeves, actually. Um, as I mentioned, right, there was all kinds of sleeves. Sleeves with very broad kind of ending, and sleeves where, you know, there's a very narrow kind of, um, you know, it was narrowly cut that way. So you have this whole area that you can put stuff inside. So that's what I did. Like when I was wearing handful last time, I would insert my handphones and everything inside here and just go out with our bag. So that was quite convenient that way. Yeah. Oh, okay. But they also have pouches. Oh, pouches yeah. too. So incense pouches and mm -hmm. small little accessory pouches. Uh, and if you're really rich, you, are, you will have your attendant with you carrying all your bags. So you, yeah. wouldn't, you wouldn't need the sleeves. Yeah. <laughs> I see. Oh, okay. So, are uh, this is there any more questions from the audience? Okay. Well, while they are typing, I actually have a question. So, uh, regarding so you, you mentioned about women's identity and 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 their and sort of the um, breaking these stereotypes. So, would you would you see these um, transformations within the fashion of Chongsam and Han uh, Han Fu? as sort of an early sign of um, feminism, ideas of feminism and women's rights? Feminism was not new. It's not a concept that's new to us. To, I think the, the funny thing is, people always think that we're doing something new. But you look at fashion like just now, 
people that think that we are at an avant-garde of fashion, that's been done thousands of years ago. If only you study history, right? <laughs> so, um, so the thing is, feminism, this idea of being empowered, um, it's always being in the mind because naturally people want equality and more rights. And it's just different ways of expression within the boundary of the society and the norm during that period. So for women wearing like a, a male robe in the Tang Dynasty, that would have been very empowering, as empowering as say the women wearing the male robe in uh, as a chong sang. Yeah. That's you. Okay. As we are waiting for more questions to come in, um, what about when you first to learn more about you and your research? Mm -hmm. So when you first started out, um, when you grew, when you first started out having an interest in these, uh, in this chong sang and han fu. What are some of the more challenging aspects of understanding this? Because uh, these are like a, l a history from a long time. What are the more challenging aspects that you faced when you were just starting on your research and some directions that you wish that you have taken, perhaps? Okay, when I started, it was really pure vanity, I have to admit, because it was a pretty dress and I thought, oh, that's so pretty, that's so nice. It's like the TV dramas. I get to be a princess, you know, that was the young me. Um, and then I started going to these nationalistic forums because Chinese were very nationalistic about the Han Chinese dress nowadays. So I started reading, I said, oh yeah, I, I'm just rejecting Chong Sam because it's so sexualized, it's all about the female, the male gaze. And then slowly, as I read properly uh, the whole, whole history, uh, and then we realized that, you know, um, the lines between what's foreign and what's Chinese and what is the Chinese identity is very blurred because for thousands of years, it's always trade. Um, and then you realize that, you know, I, there's so much I didn't know about history because I didn't have a historical back, history study background. So for me, um, history was boring. I didn't really like it in school. It's all about wars and conquests. But through fashion, I was able to see the, how it affects everyday life, how it affects women, and how certain things uh, in history and trade and all this affected how we wear and how our identity is perceived during that period. So for me, it's a very refreshing look at uh, history. Yeah, so I thought that was actually a very nice way. I, there's nothing, I, I, I'll be happy to do it again. I don't regret anything. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for sharing. Are there any more questions? Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Pam Pan, for all the questions that <laughs> you've answered us. Uh, okay, so, um, uh, so thank you so much, and thank you everybody for your participation. Uh, in the next slide, you can actually we please scan the QR code and uh, so provide us with some feedback on how we can improve upon the next time when we have the talk. And once again, thank you, Pompan, and thank you everybody for joining us today. And have a good weekend ahead. <laughs>